Uh, good day, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Gregory, your chairperson of this session. So we are starting the last session of uh, Marcel Grossman meeting, the 16th edition. And uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have wonderful speakers in this session. And actually, this uh, uh, session is the traditional for Marcel Grossman all the week. Uh, there was discussion of the current achievements, current results, and uh, this day is dedicated to the future. So this morning we had uh, great talks uh, by uh, mostly our uh, Chinese and Japanese colleagues. And uh, now we follow with the European and hopefully American speakers. So the first speaker of today is Margarita Hernandez, who will uh, talk about the enhanced X-ray timing and polarimetry mission EXTP. So, uh, Rita, you may start, Morning. please. Okay. You have 30 minutes, and then I will warn you uh, five minutes before the end of the time, okay? Okay, Thank you see my screen? Yes. yes. Please go. Okay. I think this, this morning uh, there was already partially uh, mentioned because since it's a Chinese European mission, it was already mentioned in the first session by Xuan Nanzan, which is the PI of this uh, project. So, XTP is a future space mission aimed to explore uh, the fundamental physics laws of the universe. It's a flagship ray observatory being developed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences with a large contribution of Europe. It's now in phase B. The launch is planned in 2027. The mission lifetime is five years with a wall of eight years. And it will be an observatory open to the worldwide scientific community. The observing plan is based in a core program plus a guest investigator program. So let me just uh, mention the prospective study made by ESA, which is called the Cosmic Vision uh, from the period 2015-2025 where ESA addressed um, main quest questions of, uh, uh, four questions of research across Europe and worldwide concerning the universe on our place in it. And one of them was, what are the fundamental physical laws of the universe? Uh, this uh, one, say, subsection of that was to study the matter under extreme conditions to prove gravity theory in the very strong film environment black holes and other compact objects and also the state of matter of supranuclear energies in neutron stars. So, I mean, so uh, this means to study compact objects, so like uh, compact stars, so like black holes and neutron stars, as they are excellent labs for fundamental physics. Why? Because there we find the strongest densities and gravitational fields and magnetic fields, uh, more stronger than those that we can uh, test in the terrestrial labs. Uh, so the science driver of XTP are, so the core science say, are these three markets here, so dense matter. So the goal is to constrain the question state of ultra dense matter. So the matter that made, which neutron stars have made, accretion in strong gravity. So the test of general relativity in black holes and, and also neutron stars, and also strong magnetism. So light and matter in ultra strong magnetic fields. In addition, it will be an observatory and it's ray observatory. So it will monitor uh, transient sources, including also very important the electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves for rapid follow-up. So it also it's important for multi-messenger astronomy. So uh, why one can do that? In fact, it has been advanced already saying that it's an X-ray emission, but why? Because as you surely know, the X-ray emission uh, is, there is an X-ray emission when material falls in strong uh, gravitational fields of compact stars. And so if we are able to make observations, ray observations with high time resolution, this will be a unique tool to investigate strong field gravity and the equation state of ultra dense matter in neutron stars. So just a, a nice say, slide that I will explain later in more detail, which is the uh, showing the instruments that will be on board the future XTP uh, satellite. Well, this is another, spacecraft configuration, but different than the one in the header cover page, but because there, have, there, is still, there are still different possibilities. So there will be this coverage 
of the XI energy range from 0.5 kV to 50 kV with four different instruments. And I will explain later the details, as I said. So the two, say, Europe-led instruments are the LID and the wave field monitor, and the SFA and PFA are led by China. The PIs of the European instruments, since we are talking mainly of the European part today, it's uh, Marco Ferracci from Italy and myself from Spain. So just I would like to mention that there was a parallel session in this Marcel Grossman uh, meeting in um, on Wednesday, uh, moderated by Fan Jun Lu, who is the project manager of XTP and Marco Ferracci, uh, principal investigator of the LID, and there were very nice talks that I think they'll be also available on YouTube. And I just mark some of them because I will mention them and use what was presented that there about the science mainly. So let's start with the dense matter. So the question of state of neutron stars. So I take this uh, presentation from Anna Watts here in the Marcel Grossman. So, and this has been already, of course, published. So a moment that I see here. Well, anyway, so um, if we want to study matter, you, you know, this famous temperature uh, density diagram. So with the heavy ion uh, colliders, and so experiments on ground, we can study, say, this uh, zone of high temperature, low density, but the region of low temperature and high density is not accessible in uh, terrestrial labs. So the only way, say, to advance in the knowledge of the strong force that is in relevant, of course, for uh, the understanding the nuclei in the, in the universe is to study the neutron stars. So the strong force, of course, will determine the stiffness of the neutron star matter. And this is encoded in the, so the pressure, the question of state, OK? And I don't know if you can see that now. Uh, so, and this is uh, uh, reflected, is directly related to the mass radio relation. So, what we need to do is to measure with high accuracy, a few percent level, the masses and radius of neutron stars. And then, through this representation, we would see uh, which is the equation of state. So, these are the theoretical ones, and we should put here the results of observations. So just to mention one of the uh, ways to do that, this was explained by Anna Watts in her presentation and it's also published. Uh, uh, so uh, for instance, in, we have a neutron star that is experimenting a, 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 what is called a thermonuclear X-ray burst, so nuclear burning on, on, on its top. Then uh, there will be, say, hot spots there. If they are offset, so they are not in the pole of the neutron star, then, and since the neutron stars, we know they are rotating and very fast, <laughs> there will be an X-ray pulsation related to this rotation. Then this is the, say, the basis of the phenomenon. And also there is the propagation of light. So we should observe the light that comes from this uh, burst, say. And then uh, there are several relativistic eff effects there related to the gravity, which so in fact related to the mass radius, okay? So weak gravity is different than strong gravity. For instance, here, you can see that the poles here, the variation with time never goes to zero because of light bending. And in the case of weak gravity, we have a zero here when this rotates, okay? And we don't see this hotspot. So this is just to say that there is, in the mass radius can be, uh, is also that the pulse profile will give us the, uh, counts, so the number of photons versus energy uh, as a function of phase, okay, for each phase of rotation. So we will see, we can have this, say, 3D uh, graph. The modeling will give the em emission and also take into account, of course, the propagation of light. So it will take into account all the relativistic effects. And then of course, one knows, this is an example of NICER, an instrument that is on board the International Space Station. We know, we should know the properties of the instrument. So putting all together, finally, we can derive the mass radius. And from the mass radius, so this is what is measured, relation, we can derive the question of state. So of course, there are several complications, different methods, but this is the main idea explained by Anna Watts. Well, so this has been already done with the NICER instrument on board the International Space Station, and there are these results already published. 
uh, which already start to constrain a bit the equation of state. What will uh, XTP do? Well, XTP will allow to do that with more sources, with different types of sources, because this, there are different types of accreton neutron stars and different phenomena that occur there that can allow us to do this pulse profile modeling. Then this is just a scheme also shown by Anna in this Marcel Grossman parallel session. We see that current status will be that, and then with XTP, we could constrain much better. So these, all the details are in different papers, but in particular in the white paper related to dense matter, one of the core science topics of XTP, as I mentioned at the beginning, published in Science China, Physics, Mechanical and Astronomy at the beginning of 2019. So uh, just to mention that the, uh, repeat a bit, that the, the interesting thing of XTP as compared, for instance, to the current instrument uh, nicer on board the International Space Station is that it can uh, provide multiple complementary diagnostics because it has also a, the possibility of to do polarimetry. So the combination of large effective area and polarimetry can uh, allow to do cross-checking, so different methods apply to a single object, and also to study different types of objects where you can do this pulse profile modeling. And there are also other techniques, okay? So the impact is not only in fundamental physics, but also, of course, in astrophysics, in the sense that it's crucial to understand, uh, to understand other properties of the neutron stars and to uh, the relation with core collapse supernovae, black hole formation, and also, of course, on the mergers of neutron stars that, as we know, are sources of gamma ray bursts and sources of gravitational waves. Well, uh, second topic, say strong field gravity. So I borrow it from the uh, loft, which was a, a study already uh, of a, a mission, a study that made for ESA. So uh, a proposal for the M3 call of ESA in, this, in the framework of this cosmic vision that was not, that was accepted for feasibility study, but after was a mission for observing exoplanets was approved, which is Plato. But then for the yellow book there, the, this sentence I think is very illustrative. So the strong field gravity that one can study with uh, XTP, or loft at the epoch or uh, XTP, uh, is to study stationary, it corresponds to stationary space times, not to, no to dynamic space times, which we, we, what will be studied and is being studied already by gravitational waves. Uh, detectors like LIGO, Virgo, the future LISA, uh, but will uh, study station, uh, in, in the case of uh, XTP, it will be stationary space time. Just to mention here that three uh, cases, so accreting uh, Newton stars, accreting black holes, mass black holes, this will be strong space time curvature here. And in the case of AGN, so active galactic nuclei, where we have a huge uh, mass. Uh, uh, black holes with an uh, enormous mass, then it will be the uh, weak space-time curvature. So the, we can study, uh, say, the uh, gravity in the spanning 16 orders of uh, magnitude, say, in the space-time curvature. So just to show, but there is a lot of details, and I cannot explain all in, because we don't have time, of course, but just to explain a uh, black hole here, uh, creating matter, we have the the disk, we have the corona, and there are different types of emission here that are explained in this slide from Alessandra de Rosa. Then it's possible to study through this uh, spectral timing uh, together with polarimetry, uh, relativistic rather this reflection, continuum fitting, quasi-periodic oscillation. So you can study different components in the spectrum. You can also study the variation of this. And uh, with that, one can obtain, uh, for instance, masses and spins of the black holes, but also other uh, interesting properties. So XTP will offer for the first time the most complete diagnostic of a compact sources thanks to excellent spectral timing and polarimetry sensitivity on a single payload. So all uh, the instruments point to the same source, say. Well, this is explained in this paper uh, in the same series of invited reviews made with Science China. Okay, and finally, uh, finally regarding the for science, we have the strong magnetism. So physics and astrophysics of strong magnetic field systems with XTP, this is the cover page of the corresponding paper. So here, just to mention that there is a quantum electrodynamic prediction uh, from 80 years ago, Heisenberg and others, that has not been demonstrated until very early, 
three years ago or so, or less, and that can will be confirmed again, say, and done almost routinely with thanks to the existence of huge um, uh, the magnetars, so neutron stars that have enormous magnetic fields. So the thing is that uh, uh, the propagation of light can be modified by the magnetic field, so it will be the interaction of light with itself. So this is a very small effect, depends on the magnetic field in intensity, so it's very it's hard to measure on Earth. But this effect is, uh, will, is can be substantial in the vacuum near highly magnetized neutron stars or magnetars. Okay, so then this will be an example just so you see the, the flux uh, of the light you receive from a magnetar here, uh, and you don't see the effects of uh, any effect of so you, you make the model, you compare with observations and having the uh, this effect uh, considered or not, you don't see a difference. So there are two curves here that are almost identical. But if you have, <clears throat> you look at the polarization, so just looking at the flux without being able to study the polarization, you cannot see anything. But if you can study the degree of polarization and you can see the difference. And then this is a simulation, okay, for uh, a source, a particular source, a magnetar, this one, okay, with a certain time of simulations. There are others in the paper about this with shorter <coughs> observation times, also 100 kiloseconds. <coughs> so the thing is that the, these QED effects are only visible if you are able to study the polarization of your sources, to observe the effect of polarization, okay? Well, so XP and XDP uh, will do, be able to do that in several light magnetars. Well, this is, so let's now move to the final part, which will be the observatory science. This is not the core science, but of course having a, a, a monitor, as we will show in a moment, uh, that observes the 25% of the sky instantaneously, uh, all, always, so you can do a lot of science. So it will be a discovery machine. This is again a presentation in this Marcel Grossman meeting. So different types of objects. So just I show it here one, but I will go faster because if not just to show an example here, I know because I work with on that. So the, just to compare with a previous mission, RxD. So you have here a variation in a nova explosion that can be a precursor of a type one supernova and that also can accelerate particles. This has been demonstrated theoretically and also observationally through Fermilab that has discovered high energy emission related to particle acceleration. Uh, coming from Novi, as is, say, normal for supernovae, but not so normal for Novi. Just to mention that here, this is what could be done in 2006, okay? So more than 10 years ago already. And this is what could uh, the lab combined, the, one of the instruments, the LID combined with the SFA, SFA, another of the instruments of XTP could be, do, you can see that the quality is really uh, uh, remarkable. The difference is very great. So let's go again to the, uh, let's now go to the instrument part. So we said that we need to study the X-ray emission. So this is just a comparison of what has been able up to now or regarding effective area versus energy. We have here the AstroSat, now the Indian satellite that has this 6,000 square centimeters, this nicer that I showed before in the space station, XMM Newton. So we have this order of this at most uh, areas, effective areas that are related to sensitivity. So the idea is that to go forward, a uh, new idea of detector should be included. And then these are the SDD detectors that are very good to uh, optimize the timing performance. They avoid pile up. Okay, which means that when you are detecting a photon, you are already receiving another. So for very intense sources, it's very important to avoid this pile up because if not, you are not able to to know the energy of your photons. Well, so in again, in one of these, uh, in this, in, in, there is a paper related to the explanation of the payload of the mission of XCP, and then I come back to this figure. So we have these uh, instruments, so the four instruments. So the, uh, there are three narrow field of view instruments, uh, so pointed instruments, which are these ones covering, you see, from 0.5 to 30 kV. And there is a wide field of view instrument. So the, the here is just a scheme borrowed from Yubeng, Chu from China. 
of the scheme. So we have optics here, so uh, focusing telescopes for these two instruments, the SFA and BFA, okay? And here we have a collimator for the large array detector. And here we have a coded mask instrument for the wide field instrument. So just, uh, what time is it? Okay. So just to show the different instruments, but just pay attention to what is indicated. So say in red, so the SFA soft response is what is important because combined with the LID that we will show in a moment, uh, they cover a broad energy range. Okay. And this is works with mirrors. So it has a five uh, meters focal length. That's the reason to have this tube here. So uh, the PFA has the possibility, thanks to the so-called gas pixel detectors that in fact are made in Italy and that are now since a long time ago, but they are not being flown. They will be flown in the XP NASA uh, Europe um, mission next year soon. So this allows to study polarization and then the la LID, large area detector. So it has a, see here, three square meters. We were talking about uh, hundreds at most 1,000 square centimeters before. So this will be a, a big step forward. So if uh, at the 8 kV, which is the center of the energy range important and a very, very good uh, timing resolution. So better than 10 microseconds. Okay, and combine it with uh, moderate to good energy resolution. And then the wide field monitor, which is essential to just tell the other three instruments that point in the same direction. So it will tell when there is an outburst in one of these neutron stars or black holes, and then the whole satellite will move and with these three instruments together with the wide field monitor, will look in detail. So in this case, what is important here is the field of view. And also the detectors are the same uh, with more uh, better spatial resolution to do imaging, but uh, are the same as, as those for the LID. So they also avoid this pile up, so they can do a lot of science as well. So this is the combination. And then this here is the uh, performance in context. So as, this is the LID, this is the SFA, so both on XTP, compared to Athena, AstroSat, so the current missions and future missions. So the idea here is that XTP P will focus on detailed studies of bright phenomena, okay? The brightest black holes and neutron stars with excellent timing and polarimetric capability. This is a big thing. Athena, as you probably know, is a future mission from ESA for the 30s, uh, is more focused on fainter sources and excellent spectral resolution. So they are complementary, they are not, say, competing to each other. It's completely different, say, what can be done with one and the other. So the wide field monitor, as here is a the simultaneous field of view, so an instantaneous field of view of the wide field monitor compared to other instruments. Swift back, probably you know, the one that is detecting a lot of gamma ray burst, short gamma ray burst, and also several other sources. Maxi, on board of the space station, and RXT, the one, a short one, the first uh, good timing instruments from NASA. Well, okay, so you see that the field of view of uh, the wide field monitor is much larger. It covers 25% of the sky instantaneously. And uh, the 50% of the sky is accessible at any time by the other, the, the narrow field of view instruments. Okay. So the main, I will now concentrate on the wide field monitor for the five minutes I have. Uh, so the main uh, goal, say, of the wide field monitor is to provide the triggers for the target of opportunity observations of the narrow field of view instruments, LID, SFA, PFA, which are the ones that will provide, say, the core science. So it should, uh, and there is a fast, thanks to the design of the satellite, reaction time to point to these sources. So to do that, of course, the field of view should be as wide as possible, as I have just shown that it will be the case. So another important, uh, goal of the wide field monitor is that it will uh, provide uh, alerts for gamma ray burst, okay, for any other type, say, of uh, X-ray burst. So, of course, it will do its monitoring with quite good spectral resolution, as we said, similar to the one of the LID all the time, with a, a, a huge part of the sky, but whenever it detects an interesting object, all the, the satellite will point there to do the core science. And also there will be the, this, and this will be explained later, I imagine, Jean-Luc, 
I think, uh, when talking about Schwab, so in the Schwab heritage, there is this system, but also there is the Beidou system, which is the GPS from China. Uh, so a system to alert uh, on the ground stations, okay? These are not ground stations to, to which you download data or upload data, but just you tell that there has been a gamma ray burst or a gravitational wave event, and then other instruments are can on ground or whatever instruments you have, you know, so other satellites can observe in detail these objects. So this is an extra, uh, a la swamp, say, that uh, the so-called X-Bot, burst on trigger on the inboard XTP that will be able on the wide field monitor. And then just, I can go far just to mention that the wide field monitor is a coded mass instrument. Okay, then it works by the camera pairs and here on the, I take again the more recent configuration of the spacecraft, this one. So there will be the cameras pointing, this, this is a shown shade, this is the LID, these models here of SDD detectors, these are the, the, the optics and on the bottom, there are the corresponding detectors. Here as I said, the LID and here the wide field monitor. Then you see that with this uh, configuration, it covers a huge part of the sky. The orbit will be a low equatorial orbit, so like the one of the space station, for instance, or low inclination this is important for the uh, background to minimize the damage of the detectors. This is the consortium, the Chinese institutes participating and the uh, institutes in Europe participating. You see that there is a broad participation in uh, Europe. And so, then as a summary, let's say that XTP offers a unique combination of instruments in the X-ray energy range. Why? Because it covers a broad energy range. It has high spectral resolution and outstanding timing resolution. It has polarimetric capability and a huge collecting area. It is optimized to study, which was our goal, as we said at the beginning, matter under the most extreme conditions of density, gravity, and also magnetism. And the science area, it addresses us as some of the fundamental physics topics. I hope, I hope I have convinced you even that I explain it quite fast. So, uh, equation of state of ultra dense matter and strong field gravity and uh, strong magnetism. And also, of course, this uh, a lot of astrophysics, purely say astrophysics topics, mainly related to compact stars, neutron stars, and black holes, especially when there is mass accretion onto them. So, of course, it's a time domain astrophysics uh, instrument because it will survey survey the dynamic gray sky with large duty cycle, and also it provides uh, uh, window, um, possibility to do multi wavelength multi message astrophysics, especially related to this uh, burst alert system that it will be will do in the heritage of the SWAM mission. <laughs> this will be the next talk, I think. Okay, then I can finish here. So just remind that there are these white papers that I already mentioned one by one regarding the core science here, the observatory science and the payload on the mission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margarita, for this very nice presentation, complimentary to Professor Zhang, uh, talk of this morning. And uh, uh, well, the questions, uh, please, you can either raise your hand or uh, uh, post your question in the question uh, uh, perhaps in this session, and we'll be, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, we'll be happy to answer. While we're waiting for question, maybe I can ask one. Uh, you are talking about, uh, well, first of all, of course, it's, it's great to have this mission as, as uh, every new X-ray telescope, it should bring some new discoveries, certainly, especially in the transient, uh, transient sources. Uh, but um, you were mentioning a very large collecting area. And uh, at the same time, uh, sensitivity to the brightest sources. How, how, so how does this uh, keep uh, this uh, uh, large, actually uh, with large collecting area, you could uh, actually detect uh, faint sources, isn't it? As, uh, can you repeat the last sentence? Yes, you were mentioning the, the telescope will have a large collecting area, very large. Uh -huh. And uh, that the mission is targeted to the brightest sources. 
So uh, actually with a very large collecting area, you can also detect faint sources. Why this? Uh, ah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Ah, well, okay, yes. This was just to um, compare with Athena, uh, since it's, uh, say, the other big mission uh, in Europe, in this case, from ESA, that is in the <laughs> For coming years, well, for 2030 something, uh, no, because uh, with Athena you can go to say AGNs in very far away galaxies, so you are really searching to discover new uh, faint sources. It, it's not that we cannot observe faint sources, but it's that just to emphasize that we are not looking for the faintest sources with the uh, best spectral resolution to see this iron line. In fact, the iron line appeared in one of my slides there. It's very important at 6 kV on um, at zero redshift, but that is redshifted so to 4 kV or so lower energies. So this is not our uh, objective to see this iron line with an excellent spectral resolution for the faintest sources. It was just to emphasize that it's not that we are not interested in faint sources. But already some of the sources are known, say, Others will be new, a lot of new sources, but some of the distances are known and then when they will have an eruption, we can observe them. As, so some are known and are not so faint. It was just this, perhaps it was a bit misleading. I, I see your point. <laughs> I see, I see. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Aditya Tamar. Please ask your question. Um, so the question is regarding whether uh, M87 and SAGE star are considered to be source targets for the EXTP. Can you repeat? I don't hear well. <laughs> um, are uh, M87 or Sagittarius A star considered to be source targets for the EXTP? Ah, Sagittarius A. Well, it, it can be, but I, um, I think it's not one of the most uh, interesting for XTP. But of course, it will be observable, yes. I'm not sure now. There is a list of, of the sources, but yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank our speaker again. And, thank you. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. And we can move to the next speaker, who is uh, Jean Luc Atea will present uh, uh, his talk about the SWOM mission. So please, you may start, Jean-Luc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gregory. Can you hear me and see my slide? Yes. OK. So as uh, mentioned by Margarita, I will say a few words of the SWOM mission. Of course, this is not uh, just myself. This is. Uh, on behalf of the entire Zvon collaboration, uh, which is a, a, large, uh, a large collaboration, which includes many institutes in China, as you can see here, and in France, and also a European Institute in the uh, UK and Germany, and uh, the UNAM in Mexico. So, uh, why I We'll first show quickly uh, le, the, the spacecraft here, uh, the, the anti-mission. And then I will try to go to some specifics of uh, SVOM and explain you why, uh, uh, why we believe this mission is interesting and why we believe it is interesting to have uh, just another one uh, gamma reverse mission. So here you, you see, uh, the scheme of the, the satellite uh, with four instruments. So there are two wide field instruments, the gamma ray monitor here with the three modules here, here, and here. The wide field camera eclairs here, which is provided by France. The GRM is provided by China. And two narrow field instruments, one provided by China, which is a visible telescope, and one provided by France, which is a, which is a micropore X-ray telescope. So I will go further into the description of this, uh, this instrument, so I will not uh, stay too long on them now. And then uh, along with the satellite, 
This is something we have learned from previous mission. We'll have a ground uh, segment with uh, two, uh, say, mid-sized telescope, 1.2 uh, meters for the Chinese one and 1.3 meters for the French one, which will be installed in, in uh, uh, Baja California in Mexico. And then uh, a set of wide angle cameras that will monitor the visible sky, uh, more or less at the same time uh, and in the same uh, uh, region of the sky uh, as uh, will be the satellite we will we'll do it. Uh, and of course, if you have ground satellite and the ground segment, you need to have communication. So I will explain how the satellite communicates with the ground and also how the uh, ground uh, communicates with the satellite. So let's uh, start first with a few words about science and specifically the question, uh, uh, why another uh, GRB mission? We, we have a, a very successful mission like SWIFT especially, and also Fermi and Integral and, uh, and other missions. So why do you want to have another one? Uh, the point is that with high energy astrophysics, you address uh, uh, major questions in astrophysics. So questions, so I will just go through this list very quickly, but uh, stellar explosions, uh, relativistic jets, in uh, GRBs, AGN, and there are many uh, open questions about these jets. So we, we really want to explore them in, in more detail. The physics of accretion and the ejection around compact objects, the origin of magnetar activity, the role of jets in uh, uh, the production of a very high energy or uh, ultra high energy cosmic, ray, uh, cosmic rays, the use, possible use of a gamma ray burst for cosmography and knowing the, the, the geometry of the universe, testing Lorentz variance, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many, uh, these are questions which are uh, uh, fundamental physical questions. And then there are questions connected with, which I would call more astrophysics, uh, the connection between GRB and supernova, why only some kind of supernova produce GRB, what, is, what are the conditions for the production of GRB, the origin of ultra long gamma ray burst, uh, the, there is now a completely new uh, uh, side of the universe, uh, which we are exploring, which is a black hole uh, life and uh, evolution. So we need to learn more uh, uh, about this or these objects, their place in the universe, their role and so on. And so you can do that, uh, uh, high energy astrophysics can uh, help to do that. And uh, of course, where are the binary neutron star majors? What, what are the hosts? The, you can explore the intergalactic medium at very high redshift with high Z GRB, and uh, maybe population three stars, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a number of questions which are open and which is not decreasing with time. So uh, new missions open new questions. And this is something, uh, that uh, you realize when you work in this field. And so you, 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 we need more missions. Uh, this was for high energy astrophysics, but we have also now multi-messenger astrophysics uh, with the detection of gravitational waves and uh, the discovery of binary neutron star mergers. So the origin of uh, connected uh, closely to the origin of heavy elements. And again, we want to, to understand uh, Black neutron star plus binary neutron star evolution plus black hole and neutron star binaries, which is something which is very new, which have been discovered recently by uh, the LIGO Virgo Kagra collaboration, the physics of merger, etc., etc., binary black hole demography and merger rates, uh, black hole masses. What are the masses of black holes in GRBs, which is something which is uh, for me completely. Uh, uh, not uh, addressed now. And uh, is there electromagnetic emission from binary black miniatures, et cetera. So in, in all this, there are a, a full uh, set of questions which are relevant to this kind of mission. Uh, 
Now, uh, this kind of mission, they can be addressed with various uh, sources, various objects, so gamma reverse of all types, long, short, ultra long, X-ray flashes, etc. With mergers of compact objects, which may be or not connected with gamma reverse, soft gamma ray repeaters, uh, relativistic tidal disruption events, active galactic nuclei, galactic transients, and from a different uh, perspective, maybe terrestrial gamma ray flashes and fast radio bursts can also bring some clues about the, the, this phenomenon. Uh, uh, another reason why we, we believe it is still interesting to have a gamma ray burst mission and a mission to study the transient uh, high energy sky is, that, is the astrophysical environment. So in the 2020s, uh, we will have many, uh, we will, there will be many very powerful uh, other uh, facilities on the ground or in space, which will permit to study uh, high energy sources and transient sources with much more detail. So I have given a list here, but which is, uh, of course, non uh, exhaustive. So uh, very high energy facilities, uh, many, many satellites to study the transient sky. Uh, Erosy tiny X rays, gravitational waves, neutrinos, uh, very important uh, survey telescope in the visible and in radio. So, this will permit to place the observation of high energy satellite in context. And so, it is very important to continue to observe and detect new uh, high energy transients. Uh, however, this very rich panorama. Uh, requires uh, improved coordination between instruments because you may uh, want to look at the same uh, time in the same direction or perform follow-up with large facilities and so on. So you need to coordinate the instrument. And you also need more flexibility in the observing strategy because the TO, the, the alerts, they can come from everywhere and you may want to observe them with your instrument. So uh, this makes everything more complex. Uh, and also, I think that high energy missions must be designed to take into account the diversity of high energy sources, in diversity in terms of energy, time scale, variability, etc. And some events are rare or faint. Uh, so they are difficult to, to, to catch. Uh, for instance, we had one binary neutron star merger with electromagnetic counterpart in uh, 97, and we have not observed another one since then. So it's not uh, easy science. And uh, also this calls for long mission, because uh, if you have a uh, two years mission, then you may miss the most interesting events. And uh, in, the, in that sense, missions like SWIFT, Integral, and so on, which are very long uh, lifetime are very important. So let's go now to uh, the SBOM mission. So you have already seen this picture. So I will, uh, before this, uh, going into some detail for the instrument, I, I will go through the, uh, the specific, some specific features of uh, SBOM. So uh, we have prompt multi-wavelength coverage with three instruments simultaneously. So two onboard instruments, Eclair in the four to 150 kV range and a GRM above 15 kV up to a few MeV. So we will have a very good coverage of the prompt emission. And at the same time, we have GWAC on the ground, which covers part of the field of view of Eclair. So in, in maybe 20%, 25% of the cases, we will have uh, visible plus uh, KEV plus MEV uh, coverage of the prompt emission, which is something with good time resolution, which is something which is very important to understand the physics of the, the jet. Then uh, we have a, a similar situation with the afterglow, uh, the, the multi wavelength coverage of the afterglow in X rays, and Swift has shown the, the importance of this energy range. The, the X-ray energy range. 
plus the visible telescope and the ground follower telescope on the ground. So we will have here again a good, uh, very, very good uh, uh, energy coverage of the afterglow. Uh, we will provide localization in less than 30 seconds. We have good sensitivity balance between the VT and MXT for at least for GLBs, uh, which means that uh, we believe that 70% of the GRBs will be detected by both VT and MXT, which is not the same 70 or 80%. It's not the same as SWIFT, where 95% of the GRBs are detected by the XRT, and uh, maybe 30% of them by UVOT or something like that, maybe a bit more. But there, there is an imbalance here, so it's difficult to, to, to have multi wavelength uh, observations here. We, we have a less sensitive uh, X-ray telescope and a more sensitive visible telescope. And so we, we will have a comparable uh, sensitivity for gamma ray burst. Then uh, due to the good sensitivity of the visible telescope, which can go down to magnitude 22.5 in uh, five minutes or, uh, and five minutes after the GRB. So we will be able to identify very quickly dark GRBs. And so, which are potentially at very high redshift and uh, requesting uh, more uh, deeper observation of, the, of these events. And then we have a good coverage of the prompt afterglow transition, uh, both in uh, visible uh, with the GFT and the VT, and uh, in X rays with Eclair and MXT, which have some uh, uh, common energy coverage. Uh, we, we also, in the, uh, made a lot of efforts to have a low energy threshold. So this is not the 2 kV of the XTP or 82, but this is 4 kV. And this, this is important, we believe, to study soft uh, gamma ray burst like X-ray flashes and very high uh, uh, redshift uh, gamma ray burst, which are one, one key uh, topic of the mission. And uh, another point which I would like to insist on is that all eclairs and GRM photons are sent to the ground. So we can do much more de detailed analysis and we can have some delayed trigger, of course, with a delay of a few hours for events which, can, which are maybe very long or um, with a very, or during specific period where the onboard trigger is not uh, working with uh, uh, fully, maybe during slew, for instance, or something like that. So this is something which uh, which is very important, and uh, we expect to to gain uh, maybe uh, twenty percent more uh, more burst uh, from ground analysis, which are uh, maybe which could be different from what we observe from space. So I will illustrate now two, two points here, the probe multi-wavelength coverage uh, with Eclair and GRM and the impact of uh, the low energy of Eclair with two examples. And then I will go back to the, to, to the pointing strategy and other mission uh, features. So here you have a study which has been done uh, a few years ago by uh, Maria Grazia Bernardini showing the importance of having Eclair and GRM, so the, you have the energy bands here, to detect uh, maybe black body components or photospheric, more general uh, sense, photospheric components. So to disentangle uh, uh, the many contribution uh, that contri uh, of the prompt emission, so the photospheric emission, the internal shock, other dissipation processes. So we expect to be able to get a better understanding of this uh, phase with the observation, thanks to the combination of these two instruments. And uh, of course, uh, uh, for some gamma ray burst, we will, this information will be extended to the visible with GWAC and also uh, to very high energies with Fermilat or uh, CTA, for instance. So we hope to have a, a really a new diagnostic for some gamma ray burst of the prompt emission. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, something which may be also interesting is the nature of uh, supernova, supernova-less GRBs. Uh, for instance, this GRB 
uh, showed absolutely no supernova while it was very nearby. And it is, we, we have made a study here of nearby GRBs. This is the work of our Seattle, uh, of nearby uh, GRBs. Uh, as seen by Eclair. So you see here, this is the detection threshold of Eclair. Here is the distance of the GRB mentioned on the top with the redshift and in the bottom with the co-moving volume. And here you have the signal to noise ratio and you see the, uh, at different distances, how the evolution of the signal to noise ratio. And you see that for instance, this event uh, is visible to, to large volume, so we may uh, expect to detect some of the, some events like that. And the part, the peculiarity of this event is that it was a gamma ray burst with very nearby, a long gamma ray burst and with no supernova. And if you have an event like that, uh, when uh, gamma uh, gravitational wave interferometer are operating, you will be, uh, you will know if it is, a, merger kind of gamma ray burst or uh, core collapse kind of gamma ray burst. So we have really with the combination, we know that of course with short gamma ray burst, but the combination of high energy uh, instrument plus gravitational wave uh, interferometers offers a, re a new diagnostic of these events and especially for long gamma ray burst with no supernova. Uh, let me continue. No, now I go, so this was more connected to the instrument. Now I will go to the mission uh, strategy. So the pointing strategy, the alert, uh, the distribution of alerts and the TOO program. So the pointing strategy, uh, we have decided to <coughs> not optimize the total numbers, number of bursts detected by the, by the mission. Uh, but uh, the number of uh, bursts that can be followed, uh, followed from the ground. So this is a choice. So for this reason, we are looking in the, mostly in the anti-solar direction. I will show you a picture uh, in the next slide. And then when we swarm detect a burst, it will be immediately observable, but uh, large, telescopes on the ground because the burst will be on the night over the night hemisphere of the Earth. Uh, the problem of that is that we have the Earth in the field of view during part of the, uh, during part of the orbit. You, you, you have a, a sketch here. So you see we are pointing in the anti-solar direction, so this direction. So when we detect a burst here, it will be over the night hemisphere of the Earth. And here we have the Earth in the field of view. Um, so the advantage of that is uh, that we expect a large fraction of GRB with the redshift uh, between 50 and 17%, while this fraction is about 30% for, uh, for SWIFT. So we will have a more uh, complete overview of the intrinsic properties of GRBs. And this is very important for relations like, uh, for instance, the Amati relation and so on. So it will be uh, very important, I think, to have uh, the redshift of a larger fraction of a gamma ray burst. And then uh, we will also have long exposure uh, in the same direction. We will point a few days in the same direction. And this will uh, facilitate the detection of long transients. Then uh, we will distribute fast alerts like SWIFT, uh, not with the same, uh, not with the same mechanism because uh, uh, they use TDRSS and uh, of course, which cannot be used by Chinese satellites. So we, we have developed uh, a network, worldwide network of VHF antenna, a la Haiti 2, like uh, that was done on Haiti 2. And this one will be used also by EXTP, as mentioned by Margarita. And then uh, we also have a strong TO program because SWIFT demonstrated the, the importance of uh, being able to point the satellite to a specific direction when there is an interesting source on short notice. And so, uh, 
let me let me explain that now. So here I have already mentioned the uh, the, the pointing strategy. So the, uh, this has some uh, consequence in terms of sky coverage, and you have here in galactic coordinates the sky coverage of uh, the, of eclair in this case. And what you see is that we are avoiding the galactic plane because this is uh, as demonstrated by integral for instance this is not the best uh, pointing uh, to, to detect gamma ray bursts. and on the other hand we will have a long uh, long exposures uh, towards the Virgo uh, the Virgo cluster of galaxies so this is something that we have started to, to, to think what we can do with this uh, pointing strategy uh, if we, we have made specific studies, so you have seen this study uh, here of uh, nearby uh, GRBs, but we have also uh, a study by Dagono et al. about ultra long uh, GRBs and what SVOM can do. And here you see a plot showing for a set of ultra long GRB detected by SWIFT the uh, maximum distance uh, redshift at which they can be detected. So you have here the probability of detection as a function of redshift. And some of them, they are detect we can detect them to high redshift. And so we expect to be able uh, to provide uh, crucial information on, this, uh, on these events, especially because uh, for each detected uh, ultra long GRB, we will be able to perform multi wavelength uh, study. Here, I go quickly through the VHF network. So, you see here the planned VHF network. Each uh, round here is a VHF station. So, we have started already collaboration with many institutes to install. Uh, uh, VHF antennas, receiving antennas at a crucial uh, point on the Earth. And we hope this, uh, uh, this network to be used beyond the uh, SCOM. And then uh, we, what we have, uh, with, we have demonstrated that with simulation that with this network, we will be able to receive 65% uh, of the alert within 30 seconds. Uh, on the ground, and for 90% of the alerts, it will be maybe a few minutes, something like that. And so you see here, the, in green, all the VHF stations which are already installed. So you have here a nice picture showing some of them around the world. And uh, this is an ongoing effort. So I uh, continue with the core program. The, we, with the observing program, so we have three observing programs. The core program, which is uh, the getting a GRB sample. So this is uh, the, the task of the satellite. So the GRB detection, automatic repointing in a few minutes to, towards the GRB and uh, getting the data. Then there is a general program. So while we wait for GRBs, we point the X-ray telescope and the visible telescope to selected sources, which are being defined now. Of course, we prefer sources which are uh, which have X-ray emission and visible emission, so we can use both instruments uh, very helpfully. And then we have this uh, target of opportunity program, which I will explain on next uh, slide. And then you see here the share between the three programs. So the GRB, we evaluate about 25% of the time. And the general program at the beginning will be, uh, the first three years will be 65%. Uh, and then it will, and the TO will be 15% with one TO per day. And uh, then after three years, uh, when we know, we understand better the satellite and we have done uh, uh, the main science of the general program, we will increase, we plan to increase the TO up to five TOs per day. Uh, so here is a general, some uh, comments on the, the general program and the target of opportunity, of opportunity uh, program. What is important here is that we recently added a facility, which is a short message uh, communication with BOM, 
with Beidou, we, we added, uh, the Chinese uh, I'd added uh, a receiver for Beidou, and we can send short messages uh, that uh, permit to, to do, uh, to, to ask the satellite to do target of opportunity observation, oops, sorry, uh, as soon as we have decided that, decided that it is interesting. And one another feature which I would like to, to en emphasize here is that we have set up uh, a whole system to be able to cover large uh, error uh, boxes. So making one observation is something which is easy, but having many, uh, many observations and tiling the sky is quite complicated. And we have set up a mechanism to do that, to be able to uh, observe a full gravitational wave error boxes. So I will not comment the instrument, you will have them on, on the slide. So just to show you here, I will go quickly through all the instrument, but not without command. You see here the, on the left, the, the text will give the performance of the instrument. And on the right, you, you see pictures. So here for Eclair is the, the detection plane, the mask, the full instrument integrated, an image with a, a source, and here's the onboard calculator. Here you have the three GRM modules and their, uh, uh, their uh, calculate, uh, calculator here and some performance here the X-ray uh, telescope, the optics here, and the camera here, and the instrument ready to go for calibration here. Uh, the visible telescope here, uh, we uh, undergoing the prototype undergoing some uh, testing on the sky. And here one interesting strategy, which is to, to make one bit images with some uh, very simple threshold. And you see that you can identify the images. And these uh, images are very quickly sent to the ground. And we can find uh, uh, counterparts like that, at least in the first stage. Then the full images are sent to the ground, but on a longer time scale. But these images can be sent to the ground in a few minutes. And uh, then we can find uh, the afterglow very quickly. Then the set of uh, ground wide angle cameras, which will be installed partly in China and partly in uh, Chile, uh, just to cover, uh, to, to have one set in the night at every time. And here, the two ground follow up telescope, again, one in China and one in Mexico. And uh, what, one, what is interesting is that the one in Mexico will cover up to uh, the near infrared uh, energy range here. And so uh, it will be sensitive to uh, uh, the afterglow, the near infrared afterglow of GRBs up to achieve 10 or 11. Uh, so I uh, reach my conclusion. So observing GRBs, AGN, TDEs, and gravitational wave transient sources, VOM will be a major observatory for the study of black holes and their astrophysical impact. With its unique combination of space and ground facilities, it is expected to become a key player in the fields of high energy astrophysics, time domain astronomy, and multi-messenger astrophysics. These domains are expected to develop very quickly thanks to a new generation of powerful observatories, the Vera Rubin observatories, Pan stars, and ZTF, in the visible gravitational wave detectors, SKA and FRB, FRB detectors in the radio, large neutron observatories, CTA, etc., etc. Uh, you will find more information on this paper, which describes the, the mission uh, here, the white paper, and on the Zvom website you can follow the advance of the of the project. And the launch is, I think the that is uh, almost uh, secure now, except if we have big problem, is uh, the first quarter of 2023. Thank you very much, and I am uh, ready for questions. Uh, Jean-Luc, yeah. uh, uh, félicitations. Um, it's clear uh, that the mission will certainly have 
a great scientific results. But what I would like to emphasize in this occasion is that you have been with France, one of the first European country to collaborate directly with China in a space mission. And um, at, the, at the beginning, it was not so easy, but you have established the path which has been grandiosely followed, like we have seen this morning by Nanzang and by the Einstein telescope, therefore you are a pioneer and uh, we would like to help in any way. Um, ICRANET has just developed the international joint PhD in relativistic astrophysics between, uh, uh, between the USTC, the University of Ferrara, and uh, this activity will be centered at Villarat in Nice. Therefore, this will be an, a further occasion to collaborate. Congratulations again. I'm sure you will have great success. With this Thank you mission. very much, uh, Remo. I really appreciate your comment. And uh, yes, Ikranet is very helpful also in this, uh, in this business. So thank you. Uh, if there are more questions, please ask them in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I take the occasion. Uh, I have a question. You were uh, mentioning uh, sensitivity in the soft X rays of this uh, particular mission, so uh, which is uh, supposed to be useful for detection of uh, high redshift JVs, very distant. So, what is your expectation? Of how uh, how far you can go with redshift with detections of these JVs? So the the. Yes, there are two, two points in fact. One, one is uh, the energy range, and the second is the effective area, of course, and we, we have smaller, I mean, the ZWOM satellite, I did not say that, but is about uh, uh, 950 kilograms, so it's not like uh, as big as SWIFT, and Eclairs has uh, 1,000 square centimeters of uh, uh, detectors, so it's also less than SWIFT. So, however, the, the low energy threshold kind of compensates for that. So we have made a simulations and we expect uh, more or less to, to double the, it, it depends. If we leave five years as expected, we expect to, to double the number of uh, uh, gamma ray bursts beyond redshift six which we have uh, now. So what, what, what we expect is not to get a large number, like maybe other mission uh, want to do, but uh, it is uh, to have uh, high redshift burst with better uh, environment and follow up to, to understand them better. Because they are rare events, they, with them, they will continue to be rare, but we will have a better uh, follow up and environment to study them. Okay. okay, thank you. Apparently, uh, there are no, no questions from the audience. Everything is clear. So, thank you once more, uh, Jean Luc. Thank you very much. Uh, we thank you. Uh, move to the next speaker of this session, Jim Linden, please. Uh, you may start sharing the screen. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to introduce a, a rather new project, the Southern Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatory SWGO. So SWGO is um, a project um, for the highest energy gamma rays um, that we know about, which are accessible only from the ground due to the limited collection area of, of satellite-based instrumentations. So I'm talking now about ground-based gamma ray um, astronomy. And there are two established techniques for doing astronomy um, from the ground with gamma rays. The first, well, but both make use of the extensive air showers produced by um, incoming high energy photons. Firstly, we can directly detect the particles in this electromagnetic cascade. 
To do that, you need to go to mountain altitudes, um, uh, but then you have particle detectors then, which can, can detect these sharp particles and their arrival times, and hence infer the direction of the, the primary gamma ray. Or you can image the Cherenkov light that's produced in the air by these sharp particles um, using, <coughs> sorry, using uh, telescopes and ultra-fast cameras that allow you to then image this nanosecond flash. Now, the two techniques um, are complementary to each other. With an air Cherenkov telescope, um, I can make a very precise measurement if I have a large array of telescopes. Um, I see the, the maximum of the, of the shower, so I've got a very good measurement of shower energy. Um, I can get a very large collection area, um, but I have some limitations. I have a modest field of view. Well, it depends what you compare to, a few, a few degree uh, diameter field of view. Um, and I need darkness, so I have um, uh, lost quite a, a large fraction of the, of the time. The, the other technique uses sort of closed particle detectors, so it works day and night um, and can observe the whole overhead sky. Yeah. So despite the fact that typically the precision that we achieve is more limited and the collection area is limited by the size of the, of the array on the, on the ground, um, this is still a very interesting technique in terms of wide field and high duty cycle measurements. So five well-established observatories exist um, making such ground-based gamma ray measurements. Three Cherenkov telescope arrays, MAGIC, Veritas and, and HESS. Um, and two of these ground-based particle detectors at high altitude. The first is, is Hawk in, in Mexico. Um, and the, the emerging one, um, sorry, I've, I neglect uh, an instrument in Tibet that I should have added. Um, an emerging one in China, which is Lhasa, which we heard about this morning um, from, from Roy, Roy Yu. So um, these instruments over the last few years or a couple of, couple of decades have established um, a catalog of TV up to now PV gamma ray sources. Um, the, the total number is not particularly impressive in the astronomical standards, about 240. But there's um, an extreme variety of, uh, in terms of the source classes and the kind of emission we, we see. So from um, micro quasars up to, to very large scale um, jets, distant blazars, gamma ray bursts, pulsar wind nebulae, colliding with binary, supernova remnants, starburst galaxies. So what, what we've concluded from this, I mean, this is still essentially the tip of the iceberg because this is a, sort of a new field, but it seems that the ability to accelerate particles up to TeV energies and beyond is, is actually rather common in astrophysical systems. And that with very high energy photons, we have a powerful tool to understand this non-thermal astrophysics, um, which complements strongly the existing radio and X-ray non-thermal um, probes and other messengers, as I'll come to later. So um, looking to the future and, and deepening our understanding of the high energy sky and the non-thermal universe, there are two big projects that I'm now gonna, gonna mention. Um, which make use of these two different techniques, which I introduced uh, earlier. So SWGO using the ground particle uh, technique and CTA, the Cherenkov telescope array, uh, making um, air Cherenkov measurements. So firstly, CTA, which is not, is not the topic of, of my talk, but I, I can't not talk about it. I've been personally closely involved with the project for many, many years. And CTA is, is a tremendous instrument. Um, it will push in many, many different areas in terms of performance, as indicated um, here. It's a general purpose instrument, extremely powerful and sensitive. Um, but it can't do everything. And, and I think what I want to persuade you today is that CTA is very nicely complemented by these wide field of view uh, ground particle based detectors. So obviously, for more information about CTA, you can see, for example, these, these links. Um, so, in terms of the wide field of view instruments, um, I start here with, as an example, the, the, the all-sky map 
as derived from, from Hawk. You see a band of emission along the galactic plane, and, and some point like extragalactic sources of, of gamma rays. Um, in the last weeks, this has been uh, complemented by new results from, from LASO, as, you, as we heard this morning from, uh, from Roy Yuk. Very exciting results extending this uh, picture of the high energy sky to even higher energies. These are source 12 new sources above um, 100 TeV, uh, 10 to the 14 electron volts, um, really extraordinary energies, um, showing the potential of these ground based measurements. Uh, particularly at the high energy end. So this is very all very exciting, but there's there's something wrong with this this map of the sky, which is hopefully fairly obvious, which is the huge hole in the southern sky. Lasso and Hawke are, are northern hemisphere instruments. They um, have almost no sensitivity at the galactic center um, and for the for the um, innermost galaxy. So Key targets of SWGO include the, the galactic center and the, the central molecular zone, of course, the, cent the central supermassive black hole, but also structures that are associated to that, to that region on much larger scales, including the, the, the Fermi um, bubbles, now the, now the E Rosita bubbles. Um, and, and these structures are very much easier to see from, the, the southern, uh, from a southern site than, than from the north. And between Hawke and Lasso and SWGO, we, we have essentially a full, a full map of the whole uh, sky in these, in these energies. The Fermi bubbles, we expect to, to see um, the extension of the, the emission characterized by Fermi in, in SWGO um, and to be able to distinguish between different models for the origin of the bubbles using the, the high energy spectrum and morphology, um, which is an important contribution. So the collaboration came together um, for our first meeting as a collaboration only at the end of 2019. So we're, we're a new collaboration. We managed one in-person collaboration meeting before the pandemic, which was a bit unfortunate. Um, but nonetheless, we've made a lot of progress and we've, we've built up quite a big international collaboration. Um, particularly important for us is this very strong South American role in the project, given the um, intention to cite SWGO in, in South America. But we also have strong participation from, from the US and Europe and several other countries around the world. Okay, so the basic concept of SWGO um, is similar to that of Hawke and Lars. So we will detect particles of the ground from, from cosmic gamma rays um, using um, Cherenkov light produced in the water and fast and sensitive uh, photosensors. Um, with a, a very high fill factor inner array, collecting essentially all of the particles that reach the ground um, close to the, the bottom of the, of the shower, but um, a sparser array giving us very, very large collection area and potentially at very high energies. So that's the basic idea. Um, we put together a, um, a, a set of targets for ourselves for our intended roughly three year design um, study phase in which we want to select the site of SWGO and um, establish the, the design, base, the baseline design. We, we have a lot of activity now. These are just some, some uh, names of the very active people in the, um, the, the, the coordinators of these different working groups that we've established. We've ticked off a few of our milestones the next big steps in the project are site shortlisting and to define some candidate configura configurations and finally to, to select from those to, to define the, the baseline design. Okay, so where will we build SWGO? The, um, the, the good news is we have a number of very, very promising sites. We're, we're spoiled for choice in four different countries. Um, in the Andes, we have um, options in, in Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, and Peru um, at close to five kilometer altitude, uh, all good candidate um, sites. So this is just the, the, full, the full details of the, the altitude and the, and the locations of these, these different options. Some of them are neighboring existing astronomical facilities, such as close to Alma in, in Chile. 
um, some of them are, would be breaking um, new ground. Now, um, one, one of these, you, you notice this is um, Laguna Sabina Cocha, this is a lake, um, and this is maybe not the most obvious um, location to deploy um, our instrumentation, but we have three different options for containing the water for our water trunk of detectors. We have uh, tanks, which is a bit like hawk, an artificial um, building or pond, which is more like lasso, um, and then finally deployment directly into a natural lake is something we're also exploring. So these are sealed uh, light tight units with pure water inside, but the, the support for this is coming from the shielding from, from particles is coming from the, the water in the pond or the lake. And in the end, of course, the, the optimization process is a, is a performance cost optimization, and we have many other aspects to, to optimize, including unit dimensions and further sense of choice, etc. So um, to choose a site for SWGO, we obviously need to do a lot of work in terms of characterizing the sites and understanding the, um, the practical implications of building at those sites and the, and the cost. Um, and we've, we've started to do that. Obviously, it's a bit tough during the pandemic um, to organize site visits, but a lot is possible with, with satellite data. Um, a, an, an autonomous environmental characterization station, this is our aero site, has been designed and it's going to be shipped uh, in the next weeks to, to the candidate sites, um, just to, to increase our understanding of the very local conditions. Um, in the case of the lakes, we've started to, to measure the um, the depth profile of candidate lakes and also look at starting to look at, at waves um, and other aspects that would affect the detector design. So a lot of work is, is going in and this work will lead to a short list of sites and eventually a, a site selection with the short list, something we're aiming for very soon. Similarly, in the area of detector development and design finalization, we, we're doing a lot of prototyping work. We're evaluating um, different technologies for all aspects of the detector, uh, including steel tanks or rotor molded um, plastic tanks, um, different options for the, for the photosensors and the electronics. But we have end to end prototypes now of, of um, the electronics chain to, to, to read out from photosensor to read out. Um, we have in the case of the, the lake option built at my own institute, the, the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg, a test pool, which we're using to evaluate um, the performance of candidate uh, detector units in a sort of lake, lake-like environment. So this is a huge work which is pushing us towards our, our baseline um, design, which is something we, we hope to have in a, in a year and a half or, uh, or two years. So, the, the basis of our performance optimization is, is simulations. We, we rely on simulations of, of air showers uh, and of our detector. Um, and we're, we're lucky that we're able to build on the analysis and simulations framework that was developed for, for Hawk. So this is a proven um, tested framework. Um, and now we've, we've added the sort of flexibility to it that we can test all sorts of different kind of detector units and options. This big tank is, is a hawk tank, we can have multiple photosensors in, in one volume, we can have uh, reflective walls, which is why you see all these red uh, photons bouncing around here, and not here, this is black uh, walls inside, this is white, um, and, and different detect geometries in multiple layers. So all of this is under intense study right now, um, but we have the framework now in very good shape. Um, in order to to reach our final design, we decided to establish a reference configuration um, early on, which is something that we think is sort of scientifically a, a plausible um, array that we can establish a cost for and which we know is, is re realizable with, with no tech, new technology developments with things we have in our hands right now. And this then serves as our reference to, to compare alternative approaches which require a little bit more um, development. So here we, we have, this is just listing the choices made for the, for, the, um, for the reference and the other options that we still have um, open. Uh, we also have a, a layout defined for that, a, a very compact central array, which is uh, on the same scale as the inner array of Lasso, about four times bigger than Hawk, uh, and a sparse uh, outer array. 
And the tanks of the reference configuration you see here, they have two, two layers. Um, the reason for that is um, we have an upper layer which makes a sort of calorimetric measurement of the electrons and the photons arriving at the, at the ground. Um, and the lower compartment is designed to, to measure uh, muons arriving at the ground that pass straight through easily the, the upper compartment. Um, and as demonstrated by, by Lasso, this muon tagging is an extremely powerful way of rejecting the background of, of charged cosmic rays um, that arrive at, at the Earth. So um, there is another way to do this, which we're exploring in parallel, which is to make use of multiple photosensors in the same detector unit um, to, to tag the, the muons from their sort of well-defined through growing, growing uh, trajectory. Uh, and this is also very promising and, and is being evaluated. And in the end, of course, this is a cost performance trade-off to decide. So just to, to illustrate, these are, these are simulations of a couple of gamma ray showers seen um, with our reference configuration. Um, and this really just illustrates that even for energies which were a bit challenging for, for current instruments, we have um, a few hundred GV, we have very large, um, uh, we, we have a lot of signals, a lot of tanks hit, and we uh, can measure rather precisely the, the location of the, the impact point on the ground and the direction of these, of these showers and get rid of the background. So obviously, as this gets to higher and higher energy, the amount of information increases dramatically. And our ability uh, to do accurate reconstruction and background rejection increases uh, as the energies go up. But, but even below TV, which has been challenging with this ground particle technique in the, in the past, we think we can do much, much better. And this is in part due to a higher altitude uh, and in part due to the uh, improved individual detector units. So I'm afraid I can't show you today a, uh, a real performance curve for SWGO because we're still in the process of optimizing the design, but I can show you our kind of target zone or our, our, our face base exploration zone. We're confident that we can meet or exceed the uh, curve that we had a few years ago, which we called our sort of straw man um, design. Um, we have lots of developments in the areas of improving the angular resolution and the background rejection that should push us somewhere into this yellow zone. <clears throat> uh, and also lots of ideas for how to push the performance of low energies. Um, and also we would like ideally to increase the footprint of the detector with a lower fill factor outer detector to approach or, or maybe even exceed the, the collection area of LASO eventually to have a really complementary PV detector in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, similarly for, for resolution, we have here a sort of target zone that we're aiming for. The lower bound comes from a sort of recent study we did with, with rather, uh, with some idealistic, uh, idealized detector and, and maybe some optimistic assumptions, but somewhere in this zone we, we hope uh, to get, which would allow us to achieve basically unprecedented um, resolution for such a wide field instrument um, in the in the gamma ray domain. Um, Lasso for comparison is sort of somewhere um, up here. Okay, so we set ourselves um, early in the project some uh, science benchmark cases, which we think are the kind of should dr drive our design. Our design should um, be one that can tackle each of these individual science uh, cases. Uh, as was as just discussed by, by Jean-Luc, the uh, gamma ray bursts are an important science case for, for SWGO. I'll come, I'll come to that briefly in, in a second. Uh, and transient sources in general, gravitational wave alerts and, and so on. Um, particle acceleration in our own galaxy um, is a key um, aspect in terms of extending uh, the, the known spectra to very, very, very high energies, characterizing the, the morphology of sources. We're interested in um, the relativistic winds associated to, to young pulsars and the pulsar wind nebulae and, and, and halos around these nebulae, which are now established in the TEV domain. The Fermi bubbles, as I mentioned earlier, are a key target with the, with the goal of um, understanding the origin of the bubbles and the, the nature of the high energy emission. Um, dark matter is um, another 
uh, target, which I'll come to in a little bit more detail um, in a minute, the, the Southern Hemisphere lo location and the wide field of view give us a unique possibility to probe the, the halo of our galaxy in, in WIMP annihilation, if, if this uh, is a real thing, which I'll come to. Uh, and finally, we can look at the charged cosmic rays. They're our background, but they're also of interest. The anisotropy in particular of the, the charged cosmic rays can uh, tell us a lot about local magnetic fields and the pro propagation of um, relativistic particles. So just a few a few more specifics on, on some um, cases. These, these studies were all done with somewhat pessimistic performance estimates, so you can hope for, for better than, than this. Gamma ray bursts, um, the, the sensitivity um, of SWGO will, will not meet that of CTA um, for gamma ray bursts, but being a wide field um, instrument, there is the capability to detect prompt emission. And, and SWGO has the sensitivity for the kind of gamma ray bursts that have been detected in the last couple of years from the ground for the first time would have been visible um, in the early phase with, with SWGO. So this I think is interesting also in, in the context of this FOM talk we just heard um, in terms of really characterizing the very early behavior of, of, of gamma ray bursts. But also, again, with the wide field of view, there's a, there's a, a, new, a unique opportunity to probe very large error boxes from, from, gamma, uh, from gravitational wave alerts. Um, we will be able to search for, for nearby pulsars, which are invisible through other means. I don't have time to go into that in detail, but please ask if you're interested. Um, and we want the sensitivity to be able to monitor the activity of, of, of nearby uh, active galaxies. And this, this helps us to support the CTA, but also the, um, the neutrino telescopes. So I'll also mention briefly uh, in, a, in a moment. So um, there is, of course, then huge promise in terms of characterizing the acceleration of particles to the highest energies. Um, in our own galaxy, in particular associated with our own supermassive black hole um, and the, the inner parts of our own galaxy. Okay, so very um, briefly, the, I want to highlight how SWGO will work together, I'll be able to work together with CTA. And I've done that by, by this diagram, which illustrates variability timescales for different classes of objects. And they're just sorted here in terms of distance scale um, and what I show is the sort of range of variability timescales, which is established in the TV or the very high energy gamma ray domain. So we have fast distant transients like gamma ray bursts, and then we have extended galactic emission, which doesn't vary um, at all. Um, and these are the three ways that I think uh, SWGO and, and CTA can work together most effectively. So being a very wide field uh, instrument and probing the whole sky, SWGO may um, detect high energy sources that have not yet been followed, uh, observed by CTA uh, and trigger such observations. The monitoring by SWGO of, uh, of active galaxies in particular, but also potentially um, galactic variable objects such as binary systems can um, allow us to trigger CTA and CTA has higher sensitivity than SWGO, particularly on short time scales, um, and so can really help to characterize very fast variability, uh, having been triggered by SWGO. And finally, as I, as I mentioned, as a, as a wide field instrument, SWGO has the capability to detect prompt emission from, from gamma ray bursts and other transients, and can then trigger CTA to do more detailed follow-up work and, and measure the emission um, into the afterglow where uh, the SWGO um, sensitivity would not be sufficient. So they work really well, I think, together as, uh, as, a, as a combination. Um, I wanted to mention in a little bit more detail the, the dark matter search capability. Um, the WIMP is maybe not right now the most fashionable um, dark matter candidate, but I think it's still the best motivated. Um, and that a weakly interacting massive particle left over as a thermal relic from the Big Bang makes up the dark matter. I still find a very compelling uh, option to explain the, the dark matter that we, we know exists. 
And if this scenario holds, the nice thing is we, we have um, a prediction for the velocity weighted cross section for annihilation of weakly interacting massive particles um, in the present universe that comes um, naturally from knowing the density of dark matter. Um, and with some caveats on annihilation channels and the uh, some uncertainties on the, the, the shape of the halo of the uh, of, a, of the, um, the dark matter halo of our own galaxy, we can see how instruments like CTA and SWGO can can do in, in mapping out this this dark matter. SWGO is helped by its very wide field um, of view to to track the halo onto larger spatial scales. Um, but the two again work together very very well. Um, and between Fermi and CTA and SWGO over the next uh, decades, this hypothesis can either be confirmed or really ruled out um, the, one of the options for the, the nature of dark matter. The final thing um, I wanted to, to mention are the synergies between SWGO and neutrino telescopes. So the combination of SWGO and, and LASO um, will produce a full sky map of emission in the domain from a TEV, well, from well below a TEV, um, up to um, PEV energies. Um, and this is really, really complementary to what we'll achieve with the next generation, in particular, of neutrino telescopes, so the, the IceQ Gen 2 um, and the Ken 3 net detectors in the Mediterranean. Um, in the neutrino instruments, we're, we'll always have a lot uh, lower statistics in terms of the number of detected neutrinos. I mean, the neutrino cross section is, is tiny compared to the, the gamma ray cross section across. Um, but there is the nice feature of the neutrinos that this it's an unambiguous, <coughs> excuse me, an unambiguous signature of pi on um, decay emission. So combining the sort of detailed view of the of the gamma rays with the with the neutrino view and this. Um, clear pi zero uh, so pi on a uh, charge pi on decay picture um, will be really powerful for understanding the uh, relativistic particle populations of our own galaxy and, and beyond so this this i think is an exciting possibility um, that also brings me then to my conclusions so i hope i convinced you in this brief talk that the southern sky really needs a, a very wide field um, instrument operating in the domain from, from uh, hundred, hundreds of GV up to PEV domain, um, really to give a complete coverage of the whole sky. The southern sky, of course, is important. It contains the, the galactic center, and, uh, and that has uh, a lot of implications in terms of nocturnal astrophysics and the search for dark matter, as I just mentioned. But it's really then complementary to, to LASO, the project we heard about this morning. Um, in providing this all sky view and it has strong synergies with the Cherenkov telescope array and the new generation of neutrino telescopes um, as I hopefully convinced you the targets are, are transient phenomena given the the high duty cycle we'll, we'll look at the sky all the time with a wide field of view mapping out large scale um, emission and uh, following um, cosmic particle accelerators to very, very, very high energies. So despite the pandemic, we, we are advancing in our, in our design and in our site choices. Um, if, you, if I give this talk or one of my colleagues again in, in a year, um, you'll see the, the progress that's made towards the design. We, we hope to have detailed performance curves um, on this kind of timescales. But we're still very open to new partners and new ideas. So if you're interested in the project, please don't hesitate to, to get in touch. And we're really looking forward to strong partnerships in the future with many collaborations and many different wave bands and messengers, but, but in particular with LASO and with CTA. Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice talk. Well, uh, let me just uh, comment shortly first at all very impressive presentation strong case please identify soon the lake or the place is urgent to activate very quickly this uh, observer, observatory in the in the south urgent 
because uh, we have this urgency since uh, we have learned the lecture. It took 50 years to develop uh, 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 the X-ray and so forth from space and uh, reach uh, LATA and the uh, identification of the black hole. But there is something new this year, which has been well clarified in the, in the lecture of Mirzo Jan. There is TEV radiation coming from gamma ray burst. And we expect that many, many uh, gamma ray burst will emit in TEV. Yeah. Therefore, Jeff was, but uh, from the discussion of uh, the presentation of the 12 cases of LASO, it is clear to, uh, to some of us that there is also something very, very new related to supernova, which is not just the neutron star. And um, there is uh, some evidence that in addition to the neutron star, there could be very well also a black hole. Therefore, this is something which urge to have more observation from supernova in the PEV, because the second component um, is very, very exciting. Therefore, we are at the verge of a new field. And uh, please hurry up, find the best place, and be operative as soon as possible. I know that the people at um, uh, in Brazil, uh, you have a very good people working on that. Yeah. Keep going strongly. So many, many, many thanks for this support. And we will do our best to do this in a, in a timely manner. Yeah. We see no questions. Yeah, we have a question from the audience. Oh, OK, just a second. Um, just a second. Uh, you may speak. Hello, you, you, can you can you speak? Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Hi, hi. It's a very exciting talk. Um, I, I have a question on this uh, uh, angular resolution expected. So, uh, so you, I, I see uh, the SWGO can reach a very nice angular resolution over 0 0.05 or even better. Um, so how, how, maybe I should uh, read the winner's paper, but uh, could you explain how, how to reach such a high res angular resolution? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I should emphasize this, this is the kind of resolution we would have with our inner detector. Yeah, so, the, the combination of sort of square kilometers of collection area and very high energy at very high angular resolution is, is very very difficult but but for the small area where we collect basically all of the shell particles at the ground we have a huge amount of, of information from the arrival times of all those particles um, and with a likelihood based technique which accounts for the fact there's a sort of tail of the, of the, mm -hmm. of the particles this, this is what we get. So the Werner's paper sort of does this using every shower particle and, and sort of probes the limits, but we can get, ah, we can get so, so you need to uh, put the, uh, a dense array of, of, of the particle detector. It, requ it requires a dense array. To get okay. It. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you once again, Jim, for this nice talk. Now we move to the last uh, talk of uh, this morning session. Nicholas White is going to present uh, the Gamma Explorer mission. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can see your screen, please. Okay. Start. Okay, thank you. Let me scan it soon. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, so very early in the morning here, so uh, I apologize if I seem a bit sleepy. And I also apologize I was not able to listen to the other talks in the session just because I was sleeping. But, uh, 
Uh, anyway, I'd like to talk to you today about the Gamma Explorer. This is a proposal that we are currently working on, a proposal for a, a, spa a space mission to NASA that will go in at the end of this year. Uh, it's uh, a cost cap mission of 290 million plus, plus the launch. And if we're successful with this proposal, then it will launch in 2028. And uh, why is it called Gamov? Well, uh, I'm from George Washington University and uh, the, uh, uh, one of our uh, esteemed previous uh, professors was George Gamov, and in fact, uh, using his desk at the university. And so we felt that it would be good to recognize his achievements uh, by naming this explorer after him. So we have a large consortium of uh, institutions and people involved with this, about uh, 50 people. And um, so I'm from George Washington University in Washington. Uh, the NASA Center that's helping us put this together is the Jet Propulsion Lab in California. And uh, the number of institutions, I won't go through them all, uh, who are supporting this uh, international group of folks. And uh, a lot of work has happened. This has been going for about three years now. and. Uh, and we're pretty uh, mature now for the proposal that's about to go in. So this is a gamma ray burst mission. And uh, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, gamma ray bursts are the uh, most powerful, most luminous explosions known. And uh, you usually end up in the formation of a black hole and uh, the resulting jet. And uh, if we have to be looking down that jet, then uh, we see a bright gamma ray burst and then which is from shocks within the jet the relativistic jet and um, as that jet plows into the circumstellar circum uh, medium uh, it produces an afterglow and uh, that afterglow can be used as a bright light and uh, as it decays and the trick is to get to the gamma ray burst quickly find it and get to it quickly and then use it uh, so they're both um, traces of massive star formation. Uh, we believe it's uh, massive stars that explode that create the gamma ray burst. There's also um, a lot of interest recently in gravitational wave events. Gamma ray bursts can also be created by merging neutron stars. And uh, again, uh, similar mechanisms, a jet is formed, black holes formed a jet, and uh, one sees it. Uh, gamma ray bursts associated with a gravitational wave event and this stirred a lot of excitement a few years ago. Uh, first EM counterpart to a gravitational wave event. So we have two major goals for this mission. Uh, the first goal is basically to start using gamma ray bursts uh, as a cosmological probe. And the, uh, the idea here is, as I said before, they're very luminous explosions and if you can get to them early, they are very bright. And so we can observe them out to the very highest redshifts. And in particular, we are seeing gamma ray bursts coming from the period of reionization. So redshifts uh, six, seven, eight, nine. And, uh, and we want to take it to the next step and use them to map reionization by basically looking at the bright light of the GRB and taking spectra and looking at the fingerprints of uh, what's between us and the gamma ray burst uh, to probe with the period of reionization. And uh, in doing that, we can also see metal lines in the spectra and probe metal enrichment in the early universe. And something that's intrinsic in itself and interest is, you know, what, what is going on with GRB production at high redshift in a particular, uh, perhaps population three stars, those enigmatic first stars, um, perhaps may give off gamma ray bursts and perhaps we can, uh, uh, see them that way by just seeing their GRB when they die to, from the first stars. The second goal is uh, multi-messenger astrophysics. As I mentioned, uh, there's this famous event uh, that happened in August of 2017, uh, where there was a gravitational wave uh, event that was coincident with a, uh, a GRB, a gamma ray burst that was seen by Fermi and Integral. And that led to an identification of a kilonova uh, on the sky, which um, uh, basically proved the theory that short gamma ray bursts are associated with merging neutron stars. And uh, these are more nearby events um, that, that are being seen. So this is kind of near universe. Um, and we want to basically take it this to the next step and have a capability to rapidly identify that dramatic counterpart to, uh, to gravitational wave events. 
So let me start with the first goal, which is uh, the high redshift universe. So this shows you the current state of the art in terms of measuring the redshifts of GRVs, the SWIFT mission, which has been running there for about 15 years, the Neil Garrell SWIFT Observatory, um, basically is the state of the art in identifying uh, GRVs. It has a, a wide field of view uh, instrument called the BAT, which finds a GRV, and then an X-ray telescope and a UV optical telescope, which then uh, the spacecraft points in the direction of that GRB and finds a counterpart, the afterglow. And then that can be used to uh, identify a, galax a host galaxy and, uh, and measure the redshift. And you'll see from this histogram that we, have, we are seeing GRBs at very high redshifts, and in fact, higher redshifts than the than quasars. And so they are very complementary to other techniques for probing the high redshift universe. And in particular, because they're so bright. And so we want to, the rate with Swift has been, I mean, Swift has done some really good work, but um, but the rate is painfully slow. Uh, we're seeing a high redshift GRB uh, like every two or three years, and that's um, great, but we really want to get that rate up at least by a factor of 10 so we can start to use them as probes. Uh, so the, the big, um, so what Swift discovered was uh, that when you look at uh, these high redshift GRBs, you see a, a Lyman alpha dropout, um, which is caused by the intervening material. And in particular, in this case, it's a combination of the absorption in the galaxy itself and um, the intergalactic medium. And you see all the classic things that you see in quasars. This is a redshift 6.3 uh, GRB. You see uh, the Lyman alpha cutoff with a damping wing. Uh, the gum piece and trough, and we can, you may not believe it by looking at this, but there, there is also a line of beta forest lines and metal absorption lines. Now, that, again, I want to emphasize this is really complementary to other ways of probing the high redshift universe. The nice thing about GRBs is they are very clean parallel spectra. Um, there's no sort of uh, stuff coming from an active AGN in the galaxy. Um, they also reside in star forming galaxies and typically are very um, low mass galaxies. Uh, so they're probably a kind of a different uh, regime in the high redshift universe. And as I say, they're being seen after redshift nine. So before I talk more about the science, let me tell you about the mission and how we're putting it together. So the, the problem we have at the moment is that um, it's a lot of GRBs are being seen. And it used to be every GRB was interesting and everyone is interesting in its own right, but uh, we need to sort out which are the high redshift ones so we can tell the ground based, the large ground based telescopes where to point. And, you know, they're not going to point to every GRV these days. Um, we need to tell them which are the, which are the really uh, interesting events. And so um, we've built into the structure of the mission, um, built in the DNA, if you like, in the mission that we're going to alert the large ground and space based telescopes. So that's James Webb, um, Keck. Uh, the GTC in the Canary Islands, um, the ESO telescopes in Gemini, to, to get the responses we need and to do as quickly as possible, as early as possible when the GRB is at its brightest. So we're, we're designing it to actually be very efficient in doing this. Now, as I, as I said, these are very high, uh, very rare events. And um, even with the capability we're going to uh, do for this mission, uh, only a few, um, you know, and probably like every month, to two months, uh, we're going to see a high redshift event. And the large ground-based and space-based facilities need to know reliably when to go and point. And so our strategy is basically um, to efficiently and rapidly identify the rare high redshift events uh, so we don't uh, lose any and then do it in parts of the sky, which are optimized for follow-up by James Webb Space Telescope and ground-based telescope. So, um, you know, there's no point in looking at the South uh, Ecliptic Pole because it's very hard for telescopes to go there. So, so we're gonna try and optimize. So, um, so uh, CAC or uh, GTC can basically go as quickly as possible to these GR GRBs. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to we've modeled this this mission basically on um, the Neil Garrell Swift Observatory, a similar kind of technique, and also the original Beppo Sachs Observatory, which discovered the afterglows of, of GRBs. And so we have two instruments. One is a wide field of view X-ray telescope, and we're using Lobstri X-ray optics to do that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a second. But they basically can cover a large 
regions of the sky, thousand square degrees, um, and find the GRB and locate it to our uh, locate it to our minute precision. And then we repoint the spacecraft very quickly within a hundred seconds to point an infrared telescope at the uh, the region of the sky where the GRB came from to find the afterglow. And to do two things, one to measure its position very accurately to our second precision. But the second thing is basically to um, look for a, a Lyman alpha dropout to, uh, to, to, to see this is a high redshift GRB and to tell the ground within a thousand seconds of the GRB trigger that where to look and what the redshift is so that, uh, that people can uh, repoint their large telescopes. Uh, the second part of this is that we also want to have the capability to respond to gravitational wave events. So we're also including an uplink capability to repoint both the X-ray optics and the infrared telescope um, within 100 seconds to some area of the sky where there may be a, a gravitational wave event happening. So this is a very powerful combination. So why do we go to the X-rays to find the gamma ray bursts? Uh, I mean, these are gamma ray bursts, so you should look in the gamma ray. Well, it turns out that um, if you're going to high redshift, um, the GRB spectrum is being redshifted down. Um, you also want to go to fainter GRB so you can, you can find um, uh, the higher redshift ones. And so when you put all this together and use X-ray lobster eye optics, um, you really uh, want to increase the sensitivity in the X-ray band uh, to find more of these and the high redshift ones and also to get the kind of precision we need in terms of locations on the sky. And when we do that with, with the, what we're calling the Lobster Eye X-ray Telescope, um, this shows you a comparison of where we are today with where we will be with, with the Gamma Observatory. Um, so if we start going around uh, clockwise, so first that black line, um, I don't know if I get the pointer to work here or not. Okay, maybe not. Uh, but uh, the black line shows you the observed swift rate. So on the uh, y-axis, we have the number of GRVs uh, um, uh, cumulative plot versus redshift. And for swift, you can see that um, we're only getting about one third of the redshifts for all the GRVs it's seeing. The blue line shows you if it was 100% of redshift retrieval for swift, that's the rate we would get. And the yellow line and the red line shows you the um, the rates we're predicting for uh, gamma. -op. So you can see there's a huge improvement, especially at high redshifts above six, uh, factor of 10 or more. And we're going from red, uh, from uh, GRB rates of, a, of um, uh, very low rates to, very, uh, to rates where we're gonna get at least once a month um, a, a GRB at high redshift. Now, let me talk a little bit more about this Lobster Eye X-ray Telescope that's going to do this. Um, so this is uh, based on how a Lobster Eye works. It was um, proposed by uh, Roger Angel back in 1979, and it's finally coming to fruition, uh, being flown in various missions. I think you heard earlier about the Einstein probe, which is also using these optics. Um, we're going to fly two modules that basically will cover uh, more than a thousand square degrees of the sky um, will be in the soft x-ray band. Uh, we'll have at least a seven hour minute precision and that will give us localizations to one to two hour minutes uh, radius. And um, there's a lot of heritage now with these devices. The focal plane, which is pro the, the image is projected onto, which gives us very distinctive cross shape with a core uh, PSF. Um, this is just standard CCDs produced by MIT. And uh, each detector, uh, it's a two by four array of detectors that show laid out to, to follow the optics um, and uh, cover the field of view. And this is produced by uh, MIT. I'll mention this whole instrument is led by the Marshall Space Flight Center. So basically the optics will come from Leicester in the UK, the focal plane from MIT, and then it'll all come together at Marshall Space Flight Center and be integrated and tested there. So the other part of the equation is getting the redshifts. So we're going to have an onboard photo Z telescope, and this is a very well uh, tested technique. Um, this shows you an example of a GRV uh, 090423, um, where you can see that it's visible in the J, H, and K bands, but you don't see it in the Y band. And this is basically the photo of the Lyman alpha dropout 
<clears throat> this has been used to identify high ratio quasars and high ratio objects now. It's a pretty standard technique. And so we want to utilize it here to tell us, you know, do we have a high ratio of GRB or not? And uh, it's a very simple method. And, uh, and it means we can design a very simple infrared telescope to do this. Uh, this JPL is working on this. It's a simple RC design. Um, we're going to use a dichroic beam splitter using prisms. Uh, to project onto a single detector, and we're using a flight spare detector from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, there's fortunately a whole bunch of them sitting at uh, NASA Goddard, um, and uh, so we're going to use one of those, and um, that saves us a bunch of money and keeps us using that cross cap I mentioned earlier. And uh, so this is JPL is working on this this instrument, and it means we can simultaneously do five bands. So GRBs are highly variable, and it's very good to see. Um, you want to see all five bands at the same time. Now to set the parameters for this telescope, uh, this is some work done by Alex Kahn on the right, um, where he's taken basically all the afterglow light curves uh, found by Swift um, and measured from predominantly ground-based telescopes and then re and redshifted them to basically redshift six. So he's both time dilated them and adjusted the luminosities for cosmological effects <clears throat> to show what all the um, GRB afterglows look like. And we can use this to sense, set the sensitivity requirements for the instrument. So we want to get to the, uh, get a redshift measurement within a thousand seconds. And that shows you that blue dotted line. And we want to get at least 80% of these uh, as redshift. So that sets the other direction. And that sets a sensitivity of about 15 microgen skis, which is an AV of order 21. Um, and this can be accomplished with a, a very modest 30 centimeter telescope in space. <clears throat> and this shows you the sensitivity of the NeoSpec instrument on James Webb. James Webb actually has a two day, uh, what's called disruptive TOO um, mode where you can repoint. It does take two days, unfortunately, but James Webb is so powerful that we are still very sensitive to uh, getting uh, good spectra um, uh, of the afterglow to do the measurements we want to do. So there's basically, in terms of getting these high redshift GRBs, uh, you're basically, you have a predicted rate, which I showed you. We have an observational efficiency, which we're gonna make very high, 95% or better. And then the redshift retrieval rate. And as I mentioned, Swift has a 30% redshift retrieval rate. It still does, um, still operating. Um, with gamma off, we're going to make this at least an 80% redshift retrieval, and we're going to make the uh, uh, use a, an observationally efficient orbit. So we're going to put this mission into an L2 orbit where there's no the Earth does not get in the way, basically. And so by doing this, we really up the rates from, as I say, like every other year, you get a high redshift GRB. Although Swift actually, uh, recent times, has not really been finding them because I think the ground-based telescopes are just not responding anymore. Um, with gamma off, we will get, um, as I say, probably once every month or two months, a high redshift event. And even though those numbers still may seem small, uh, simulations we've been doing, which I'll show you shortly, show that we, we can actually do some very impressive um, science on reionization and uh, early metal uh, enrichment. Just wanted to mention the orbit we're using, the uh, L2 orbit. Um, this has become a, a great place to put astronomical telescopes. That's where James Webb is going. Um, uh, e Rosita is there. And uh, it means it's basically uninterrupted. And it means we can also um, point in directions of the sky that are optimal for follow up. So, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope has a field of regard that is where it can observe on the sky. It has to be between 135 and 85 degrees from the sun. So we will point into that region. So we know every high redshift GRB is available in James Webb. And we'll also optimize it for both Hawaii and Canary Islands and Chile to make sure those telescopes can do it. Um, and this kind of shows you, this is some work done by Jamie Kano, who, who runs the Swift uh, Science Operations Center, showing the field of view of Gamov's LEX instrument, the, what we're using to detect the GRB. Um, with a different constraint. So the green is the galactic plane, which we're trying to avoid. The red bullseye going through is the anti-sun direction. Um, the other bullseye is the sun direction. And you can see that we're able to basically avoid all the nasty parts of the sky 
those two lines across show you sort of a deck constraint. So to make sure it's available to all the ground-based telescopes, that can be relaxed if we need to, uh, especially if we want to focus on say Northern hemisphere or Southern hemisphere. The last part of this is we need to get the um, GRB uh, information down as quickly as possible. So we're using two ways to get the data down. We're going to have a low data rate, real-time communications um, that uh, will be 24 seven. And uh, it's actually using very modest, what's it called K, K satellite, uh, four meter, 3.7 meter aperture um, ground stations. Um, and these we can get down about uh, six to seven kilobits of uh, science data, which is quite adequate to tell us where the GRB is happened, where it is and what it's redshift is. And we can also use it to uplink and, and repoint the spacecraft uh, on demand, so to speak. And then we'll have a, a, a high data rate, uh, like once a week, where we download all the production data and uh, that will come through the, uh, the NASA uh, Deep Space Network. Okay, so um, let me just talk a little bit about the science that we're going to do with this mission. So probably the biggest theme of the mission is doing the uh, reorganization and turning GRVs into something that, you know, in, in themselves, they're interesting, but to use them as astrophysical probes and to really understand what is going on with reionization, the period of time when the universe went from a neutral hydrogen phase uh, to ionized. And the question is, what reionized the universe? Uh, how quickly did it happen? Um, was it caused by uh, UV emission from massive star formation? And uh, you know, how much UV EV was produced? And, uh, and then could it get out of the galaxies to actually reionize the IGM? And if it isn't that, then what is it? So we're going to measure with this mission the global star formation rate, um, the scape fraction, and the timeline and topography and two chemical emission at the same time. So this shows you, uh, I pulled this from a paper by Otto et al. Um, I think there's probably some more recent plots around, but it gives you an idea of the constraints on reionization. Uh, the the y-axis is the, uh, the fraction, the uh, neutral fraction, um, going from one at high redshifts to, uh, to opaque, uh, to, uh, one and opaque at high redshifts to uh, uh, transmissive at lower redshifts. And the blue area is the constraints from the Planck mission. Um, this is an integral measurement. So it gives a, it tells us the reionization probably happened between six and uh, nine. It doesn't tell us a lot of detail. And those points you can see are current measurements from different techniques, including quasars, uh, GRBs, the green lines, uh, green uh, points, uh, Lyman alpha emitters and, and other techniques. And you can see at the moment, there's really no real constraints on reionization. So what will we get with this mission? So there's a paper that uh, is now on the preprint server by Adam Litz. Litz, it's uh, work that's been done by him and others, um, projecting what kind of performance could we get from a gamma ray burst mission um, where we have uh, say 20 GRBs, that's our fiducial for gamma. Um, assuming a particular star formation rate at uh, high redshifts, which then tracks the number of GRBs, um, and then maybe an enhanced star formation rate. And then uh, we also included the projection for the Theseus mission, which is a very similar mission that uh, unfortunately ESA did, decided not to proceed with. Um, that was announced about a month ago, but uh, that would have, uh, in its best case scenario, gotten maybe 80 GRBs. And you can see that uh, for, for this particular model of the IGM, uh, that uh, we can do really well, uh, even with 20 GRBs, which are the black uh, lines, which I hope you can see. Um, the blue line, sorry, um, and the black lines is the best case, and the red is somewhere in between. So we can really uh, get very good measurements for this particular model, and then test different models for uh, you know, rapid reionization or slow reionization. And this is kind of, you know, this would be a definitive uh, measurement uh, using a, you know, a particular probe of the high redshift universe. Now, this, this uh, another thing we can do with this mission is measure the escape fraction, the number of uh, UV photons that are getting out of the galaxy. I mean, the galaxy itself has neutral hydrogen in it, and um, the photons have to get out of the galaxy to re-ionize re the IGM. And this shows you a GRB at around redshift of six, 5.91, um, showing the Lyman, the Lyman alpha line. And in this case, it's dominated by the galaxy. And, um, and this 
what we expect at the redshifts around six that the galaxy will dominate, whereas at higher redshifts, the IGM will dominate as, as it um, becomes neutral. Uh, but for, for this case, you can actually measure the um, uh, hydrogen absorption in the galaxy and use that to constrain how much of the UV photons get out to reionize the uh, IGM. And in this case, it's pretty high, the absorption, and probably would not be sufficient to, to reionize the IGM. And so this is a measurement that these are measurements this is work done by Neil Tanvir, where he's basically taken um, uh, a lot of GRB measurements and measured the uh, the columns uh, in the galaxies and in the lower redshift universe um, are not uh, there's a lot of absorption and, and not enough to get uh, photons out. Um, with gamma, if we will look at redshift five, six, and beyond um, to make these measurements to see in the high redshift universe, you know, can enough UV photons get out? And in doing that, we can uh, measure the escape fraction. And this is a pretty unique measurement uh, to, to this kind of uh, GRB mission. Um, and the blue uh, lines show you kind of the constraints for 20 GRBs, um, the escape fraction on the x-axis, and then a, 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 U, a UE flux measured in the infrared because it's high redshift, uh, you know, how, much, how bright are the galaxies, and, and whether or not there's enough photons to reionize the universe and that. It's basically on the right side of that red line. Okay, uh, just quickly, I will talk about the uh, chemical enrichment. This shows you uh, one of the fainter GRBs at high redshift that's been seen. Um, and even a VLTX shooter spectrum after two hours is, I mean, it'd be good enough to do the Lyman alpha dropout, but it's not really good enough to do metal absorption, but it shows you what the coming ELT would would obtain on that GRB, and you can see all these metal lines, um, which tell you a lot about um, the, the metals in the in predominantly in the host galaxy uh, in this particular case, and um, and so we want to use these metal lines to basically trace the abundance um, of metals uh, with redshift, and this shows you a plot for Q, you know, quasars and GRBs. Um, the, the GRBs are squares, the quasars are crosses. Um, out to, to redshift six. And you can see there are some trends there to lower metallicity in the higher redshift universe, um, as you would expect, but we really want to get above redshift six and we can use GRBs to do that. And this shows you some simulations done by uh, Louise Maribas at uh, Caltech JPL. And they're uh, showing that, you know, we can get down to metallicities of uh, a hundredth, even a, a thousandth um, out of these high redshifts. And this is really important in constraining um, the chemical evolution of the universe and how the first metals um, were polluted, basically, the IGM and, and the early galaxies. And lastly, um, just the GRB rate as a function of redshift tells us a lot about star formation and what the stars that are basically creating the, the GRBs. Um, this is some work from Dan Curley from 2016 using the SWIFT sample um, where he plots the number of GRBs as a function of redshift. And the red is the, um, the star formation rate from uh, other methods. And you can see the GRB rate roughly tracks star formation. There are some differences uh, and there seems to be effects coming from metallicity. Uh, GRBs seem to favor low metallicity environments. Um, and we expect at high redshifts, uh, things will change, especially um, uh, the uh, you know, population of three stars may come in, the lower metallicities cause different effects. Um, and so we're really looking to improve the error bars in this high redshift region, which are pretty large at the moment. And this is some work that's been done by Chris Farr at Los Alamos and Amy Lean at uh, Goddard. Um, basically taking, um, supernova rates and uh, you know what fraction of those are GRBs and then looking at uh, star formation rate and how that changes the redshift making assumptions on how the IMF underlying IMF may change metallicities percentage types and so on and so forth and I won't, don't have time to go into all the models but it shows you predictions for the uh, number of GRBs per year and, and this is uh, uh, you can see there's big differences and so what we observe, we can use to basically constrain um, models for GRBs and the underlying population of, of, to create GRBs. And uh, so this is uh, you know, gonna be very important work as to just the fundamentals of what creates GRBs. 
So let me finish by talking about the other science goal, which is uh, to find X-ray and optical counterparts to gravitational wave events. These lobster eye X-ray telescopes are excellent uh, wide field of view instruments. And with a thousand square degree field of view, that's ideal for pointing at the, um, the, the area of sky where a gravitational wave event is going, is, is occurring. I mean, some will occur naturally in the field of view, especially the black hole mergers, uh, though we're not really anticipating big electromagnetic signatures there. But uh, for the binary neutron star and potentially neutron star black hole mergers, um, we're expecting a big sen increase in sensitivity from the ground-based gravitational wave detectors, the so-called A plus or O5 run, which is now currently projected to start in 2026. Uh, other people on this, uh, this conference may have a more up-to-date date on that. But we want to have this capability up there um, to be coincident with the O5A plus run and, and even the future projected um, capabilities that are coming. And our idea is basically to trigger the, the next instrument, this wide field of view X ray optic, to be on target within 100 to 1,000 seconds for half of the sky. And if we see an X ray source, then to point the infrared telescope to get in our second position and characterize uh, the kilonova as, as it as it starts and evolves. And we have a horizon of about 200 megaparsecs, which is, um, which is pretty well, uh, pretty consistent with um, what uh, is gonna be happening with A+. And I'd also note this is, will be a great capability for time domain astronomy, um, uh, following a neutrino events and, and other uh, gamma ray, uh, and, and just in general, so say the LSST, Rubin uh, telescope and, uh, and what, uh, transient events that supernovae or whatever we would see. Uh, let's see, so I'll skip that, but we're, I mean, the rate, I'll just say the rates for the uh, A plus are very uncertain. And, uh, you know, it could be one a month, or it could be um, one a year, it could be who knows. So, um, you know, it's a lot of uh, modeling out there trying to you know, be optimistic or pessimistic. But what we, what we would like to do is basically get, um, pointed at these events as they are happening. And we're, it's possible to get a pre-alert. Uh, these mergers, as they begin, um, you can actually get an alert before the merger happens from the ground-based gravitational wave uh, capabilities. And we're designing this so we actually start the maneuver to point the LEX at the area of sky where it's, it's happening and potentially catch the merger in the act and see X-ray emission either from the short gamma ray burst or, or other um, processes going on in the early phase of, of the merger. And this shows you some projections based on previous uh, short gamma ray bursts uh, that we can see. So I'll, I'll wrap up there. Um, I think maybe a little over time, but I just want to say that, uh, you know, this mission is very exciting. We're, so we're in the process of proposing it and uh, it will go in at the end of this year, and then we go through a long process to see whether it will be accepted, which takes two or three years. Um, and we will launch it in 2028. Um, we really want to turn around using gamma ray, just you know, observing gamma ray bursts because they're interesting in themselves to actually using them as cosmological probes. We want to have a launch in 2028 that overlaps James Webb and, and the A plus gravitational wave. and. We see it as a key component of the multi-messenger time domain astrophysics network at the end of the decade. And we're optimizing it um, by putting it at, the L, at L2 for, for follow-up observations and rapid response so we don't have to worry about the Earth getting in the way and other uh, complications in low Earth orbit. And a lot of this technology is ready to fly. It's high heritage. And we are welcoming international contributions. The mission's quite mature now, but we're still uh, interested in adding international contributions. So feel free to get in touch with me and I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Nick, uh, yes, please. Yes, thank you, Nick, for, for this, uh, for your effort to present in, uh, this wonderful talk, especially this early in your time, uh, but uh, it was worth, I hope. Uh, and uh, we are, yes, please, uh, we have a word last question. Um, there is any question? If not, uh, I would like to. Um, uh, Nick, are you there? I'm still here, yeah. Yes. 
Well, uh, one of the good things about the meeting is that everything is recorded in YouTube, and there have been a lot of discussions about also the gravitational waves that are recorded, and it will be good to, look, to go back to this. But I would like just to mention something different. It, uh, it is um, um, clear that uh, the gamma ray bursts are very important. That is no problem. But it's also clear that there are new aspects of gamma ray bursts which we have not yet used, uh, used and uh, focused on. And uh, it is extremely important to have high resolution, more short time scale in uh, the around 0 0.6, 0 0.3 MeV. Because uh, there, is, there are phenomena which we call the UPA phase in GRB very powerful, like 19 of 114C which last only two seconds. In these two seconds, more than 40% of the GRB energy is emitted, 40%. And that, that uh, uh, which we call ultra uh, prompt emission, a structure. And to know the structure on shorter and shorter time scale, therefore you need a source powerful and close enough, but you need a detector with short time scale could be the key of a new science of a quantum, effect, quantum uh, process, discrete quantum process. This is a new window. And similarly, there is a new window in the early phase of the, GR, of, the, of the most powerful GRB, in the first fraction of second at, after the trigger, this time in the X-ray. Therefore, uh, there is a new frontier to take into account. We uh, will send you some of the recent paper which we are under uh, 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 and uh, they are on the verge, but you can already find some in the presentation. Door. But to tell you that there is even in gamma ray burst a new frontier, which is nothing to do with uh, <laughs> with the because, uh, because yeah. I think really the action is in the GRB on short term scale because they can tell us about fundamental physics. We have heard some of the presentation, very exciting, about to look not to the classical, that is okay, to the quantum structure of the signal in GRB. It's fantastically important. It goes really to the art of fundamental physics. Therefore, keep going because, but be careful about time resolution. As yeah, much well. time resolution you can get is very, very precious. Yep. I mean, there are a number of uh, especially CubeSat missions that are being designed with that kind of time resolution. And uh, so we, what we're doing is, is trying to be complementary with other gamma ray burst missions that are being planned at the same time. And then we can be simultaneous with them yes. uh, to see GRBs and fit in with their but uh, let's be emphasized, it's not uh, a small amount of energy which goes in this quantum effect. I'm speaking about 40% of the energy of a GRB. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Okay. Th th thank you again for the very, very beautiful talk. Very interesting. Yes, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, we uh, still have some five minutes before the round table starts, so we can still have uh, some questions for all the speakers of this session or the previous session this morning. So anybody interested, please uh, raise your hand and uh, you can ask your question.
Okay, since there is no question in the audience. Therefore, we are going to end the, this last uh, uh, plenary session of uh, Master Grossman meeting. And in five minutes, we will start uh, the round table, which is in the Galactic Center. Uh, will be the first uh, talk by Professor Gensel. And uh, then we will have some uh, discussion after his talk. So uh, Professor Gensel, if you are online, could you please, uh, just to make a test, share your screen a moment and see if everything works. Five minutes coffee break. Yes, please. We, we will do so a short test now for the- Okay, so, sure. Yeah. No problem whatsoever, there we go. Yeah, we can see you. Yes, we can see your slide. Perfect. All right, got it. All right, everything is great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We just wait a few minutes. Sure. Thank you. <coughs>